Hey, nice warm afternoon. I think the heat index is 100 plus. Last I looked, something like that. Nice breeze today. Tim, one of the guys worked with us, has just terminated a few, several weeks back, actually, a bunch of weeds in the bottom. You may recall this. We had standing cedar trees, cut a bunch of those, got some cedar logs out, opened this up where we could see to, from our redneck blind to make a shot through a native vegetation area. Bunch of fescue in there. Native vegetation is not going through that fescue. You got to set it back. So Tim sprayed it. It's gotten dry now. Dried really well. We're going to drop a match today to get some of that stuff out of there, kill some of the weeds that are growing right now, a few hardwood saplings, and reset the clock to get some summer native vegetation growing in the area. Great thing about these hot days, it's a great day to break an intern in or a couple of interns to working here at the Proven Grounds. Being a real wildlife biologist, getting some field experience. So these guys have been doing great. I've got Stone and Jack right here. Stone is from Georgia, Jack is from Wisconsin. They're both in wildlife programs and doing an internship with us. Jack's gonna be here for a year. Hopefully after a day, he's gonna be here for a year. Stone's from University of Georgia. I went to school at University of Georgia, know how good it is, but this is different than classroom, Stone. Yes, sir. No, these guys have been doing great work. We're getting a bunch of work done this summer. Super pleased with them. And I'd encourage all of y'all, whether me or someone else, if you're wanting a wildlife degree, the thing that's shortest on all the resumes is experience. You know, oh, I played volleyball, you know, you did whatever. You need to know how to do a prescribed fire, how to treat noxious weeds, run a chainsaw. You need to be able to do field work because most likely as a wildlife biologist, you're not starting in an office. Isn't that true, boys? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we're actually, it's a really small, easy fire. We're gonna let them carry the drip torch. Daniel and I be walking along with them, teaching them some fire behavior, what to look for, what to worry about, what not to worry about, and add that to that classroom knowledge y'all have gained. You guys got anything you want to say? Ready for it. All right, that's the attitude I like about interns. So if you're curious about an internship program, you can go to growingdeer.com at the bottom page there somewhere, something about interns. There's some forms you can fill out, whatnot. We also have video production interns. Matter of fact, our camera's being held right now by Wyatt, who's doing a stunning job. He's going to be here with us through the hunting season, and I'm real excited about being in a tree with Wyatt, he's probably going on elk hunt with me also. That's a great way for real guys, I mean, to video it, produce a hunt, of course, with some guidance from Daniel and Colby and the team, and weeks your feet wet, and we have a really high placement rate from our good interns at getting them a job in the wildlife profession. So, you know, even though this is a very small, safe fire, we always want to be able to put a fire out. I like to use the word prescribed fire. Some people use controlled fire. That's a bit much for me, right? Controlled fire means there's no chance anything's going wrong. Prescribed fire means you've studied the weather and the fuel loads and you've written a prescription to have a very safe fire that accomplishes your mission. I think prescribed fire is a better term and we're gonna do a prescribed fire today. Hopefully we don't look really, really sweaty when this is done because we're really bad shape, probably means we had a little jump and we had to hustle a little bit. Got some matches, got my drip torch, never more than one third gas, because this thing could become a bomb. So we mix about two thirds diesel, and you notice when it gets really hot, it builds up pressure and we'll be shooting out. This crook in the neck right here mm -hmm. keeps flame from getting down there and you know making a bomb, and we all get to go see what heaven looks like a little bit earlier. Let's get up a couple blowers. I'm gonna do the hard part and carry the torch here. Oh yeah. This will work. This will work. So we'll let them get started, but the weatherman says the wind is out of south, which would be this way. Okay. Going that way right now. We want to start with the wind pushing towards the fire break. That way there's minimal flame height. If we go in the middle and light it and we get a big 15 mile an hour gust of wind, which could happen in this bottom. You know, it'd be blowing tall flame height and it could lap over or jump over our fire break. So we want to start right next to the fire break and that way minimal flame height, get a black area that expands the width of our fire break a lot because right, a fire break is no fuel. So if you got a big black area, there's no fuel there and then you can be a little bit more aggressive in your lighting. You may want to see a patch of saplings or something and then you do a, a 20 yard what we call a strip head fire. You drop down there 
light it 20 yards back, let the wind push it to kill more saplings, have a more aggressive fire, higher flame height. But starting off, we want to start right here on the fire line. We'll be standing around watching. It sounds so exciting. It's kind of boring to actually get started. You go, is this thing ever going to go here? anywhere? But don't here worry. We'll take care of that a little later on. That is very dry. I just need a little fuel right there. Yes, and I'm going to set that back here. And I'm just going to... Just like that. And this is our little test fire. See how it does. And whoo, it's going. Look at that. And then we'll just we'll just give it a second, see what the wind's doing. It's obviously pushing in there. We got a south wind here, but down here in the bottom, it's kind of doing its own thing. Following that fuel, of course, we've removed the fuel all here. And you can see it's going out where you've removed the fuel from your line. There's that wind switch going to big heavy fuel there. I'm just going to let it do its thing, see what happens here. Let it settle down. See how it's starting to just start creeping across there? And we got to be really careful where we're pointing this nose. When I get fire on here, if I put it on my side like that and it drips fire, it's going to go. So I'm treating this like a loaded gun. I'm just going to always keep it pointed. I'm always kind of swiveling around this. I don't want to drop it in my line, look back 20 yards, and it's creeping. So Jack and I lit the opposite corner of Daniel and Stone, and you can see in the, you know, where the vegetation's been sprayed, man, it's back and nicely. So you got three, four foot flame height. I can feel the heat coming off here. I actually lit this up here where there's green vegetation. And the guy's just weedy to the line to make our fire break. You can weed it down to the ground, I'm getting out of smoke, to make a fire break. And it's barely crawling. Just that amount of green vegetation, here we are 100 plus degrees or whatever, just that little amount of green vegetation will stop a fire because there's that much moisture in the fire. So brown will rot, green will crawl, if it burns at all. If this was earlier in the spring where the plants were holding more moisture, I doubt it would carry it all. Let me get the cameraman, Wyatt, out of smoke. He's over here about to gag on me. He's doing a great job holding the camera still. So it's gonna back in here in a second. On purpose, I want this to back in to some cedar limbs we cut so we'd have a better view from our redneck blind. And the cedar limbs are pretty green. Ideally, I would hit this with a big head fire to try to get more heat to it and burn it. But it's so close to our fire break, I don't want to light it up and it's 15 feet tall and could then throw a spark or an amber across our fire break. So I'm going to let it back through, see what happens. We can burn that down one other day, be like a little, you know, what it doesn't burn, we're stack up, make a little campfire, it's a 10 minute gig. So green vegetation with water in it is not hardly carrying. Uh, the dry stuff where it's been treated with the herbicide, man, it's like a match. And you can see on Daniel's side, he lit this and bit it again. We've backed, it's a backing fire for the most part, wind swirls a little bit. We've backed, what do you think, Jack? 10 yards or so, something like that? Just about, yeah. Yeah, so it's doing a great job backing. Again, the predominant wind direction today is out of south behind me. And it's hot, that's uphill upstream, so the thermals, heat is rising, hot air balloons rise, so it's carrying the wind primarily that way. So you can see all the flames bent over this way, that's because the, the wind and the thermals are taking it that way, and it's just eating through. And where there's dry fuel, it's a constant line, there's no skips. Over here in the green, it's putting up a lot more smoke. If you follow me back over here, the green has a lot of moisture in it, and it's putting up a lot more smoke. Now notice those, you know, tall weeds, quote unquote, are shriveling up, they've already wilting, with a little puny two to six inch fire. That's because there's a lot of moisture in there, and it's probably getting hot enough to boil or close to it, and as those cells expand from boiling or expanding, not even boiling, expanding water, hot water expands a little bit in size, uh, it's rupturing those critical cambium cells that plant circulatory system, it's rupturing those and it's killing those plants. They're, they're annual plants, not worried about it. 
What we do want is better native grasses and forbs recovering this area, restoring this to a really good native grass and forb meadow for a lot of reasons. Let's just step right over here and you tell me if you if you feel any change. All right. You feel anything? Much cooler. Ooh, 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 point that. You see that? Did you see that shoot out of there? No, sir. I heard it. That's why you were always pointing it away, just yes, like that. Okay. Because it can get hot, it gets real volatile, and it can shoot out the end. It's just like a flamethrower. Yes, sir. You did a great job. You were pointing out in a way. You weren't pointing it at me or anything. Yes, sir. Safe into the fire, mm -hmm. just like you're supposed to. But what's it feel like right here compared to just two feet out in the sun? It's a lot cooler, uh, more humid for sure. You can feel it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Drop, and we got green mm -hmm. vegetation. Go ahead and just drop, drop a light right here on the edge, and let's see what happens. It just goes out. That humidity, it's all about the humidity, those conditions, humidity and the fuel load right there. It's greener, we're really humid, just like we were talking about earlier, that fire's probably not carrying today in the timber because of that humidity. So that's why we're, we're going ahead and we're just going to light right along the edge here in the sun and just let it back out in through here. Smoke over here with Jack and I is going this way. Smoke over Daniel's starting to come this way, but look up there by Tim, it's going the other way. That's swirling winds. Even though it's hot and should be going one direction, imagine if you're hunting here. In a few minutes, your scent is going around the clock, around the compass. Scent lands on vegetation, it'll stay there a while. That's one reason I love that redneck up there. You're in there with almost all or all the windows cut. You're leaking a little scent, right? If you weren't leaking some scent, you'd run out of air and suffocate, but you're not putting a whole bunch out like I am talking loud now. And I've, I've got away with so much with deer walking by that redneck blind. Downwind, I'm going, oh, they're going to bust me any minute. You know, the buck's back behind, button buck in front, I don't want to take the shot. But then they just go right by. And uh, scent, I don't believe I can spray anything on my body, control scent, because I'm always respirating. I can spray under my arms, you know, all my clothes. I'm still respirating, and that's the magic bullet. It's not a little diesel smell or something. They smell tractors all the time in most places. Yes. What we breathe out says human, and we want to control that as much as we can. Wind in your favor is great. This bottom, and the way to smoke, now the smoke that was going that way, look, right on the edge, it's still going that way, right? It's being pulled to that cool area by the creek over there. It's rocking up this way in, what, 10 yards different space? So we love hunting ridge tops like that big mountain back there behind us because up there, I promise you, the wind's going one direction. Here it's bouncing off the sides, bouncing off these few cedar trees. On top, there's nothing between the wind source and me for you know, a realistic distance. Yes, sir. And that way, the wind's gonna go one direction. I can approach hunt and exit without alerting deer. This is an extremely successful burn as you look back through there. There's a few patches where there's a lot of cedar needles Surprisingly, cedar needles don't burn, but one of our missions was, besides doing a quote-unquote growing season burn and converting this dead thatch into slow-release fertilizer, was to get Jack and Stone some experience with a drip torch in a very controlled environment. What did you learn today, Jack? Fires are hard to control when they get out of hand. Yeah, but we didn't have that. No, Tell the folks no, off the bat. No, no, yeah. No. yeah, but, but they you, run. They do run. We lit some strip head fires. Why don't you explain what strip head fire is? Strip head fire is basically where you go in sections where you know it's already gonna burn, hence where there's a lot of brown, you know all the dead brown is gonna burn, so you leave some room in between each 
spot where you light so that way you're saving energy saving uh the fuel and then it just burns right through so you don't have any space in between yeah great you got a black area downwind it's already blacked out so you don't have to worry about going anywhere drop back 20 30 40 yards light a fire that the wind can now push it versus backing yes, sir. head fire goes much much quicker and a little bit more intense how about you stone watch an observation you made i learned you really have to watch your fuel type and you really have to watch your wind uh, we, we came to a corner and lit a fire um, in two different directions and when they came to meet that wind started swirling it picked up a lot of ash which could cause a lot of trouble if you didn't know you know didn't have a good fire break or had a lot of you know fuel on, on the other side of your fire break. Yeah and both these guys are hunters besides being wildlife biologists what did you learn from a hunting point of view? This is going to do wonders for the deer and their habitat especially with food. Yeah but what did you learn from a hunting point of view? It's going to it's going to put a lot of nutrients in the ground and you know allow you to I think guys are trying to be scientists. I think I know what you're coming at. Okay, try it again. It has to do with the wind, and down here in a, in a valley like this, down below, the wind is going to go all sorts of directions. That's my boy. Oh, yeah. Man. Wind swirls in the valley almost always. Even in the heat of the day, like today, that you should be just running upstream. In these tight valleys, it like a trout stream. It bounces off this side and eddies around that tree and swirls. So... Tough to hunt down here. I like hunting in these valleys on a really, really cold morning. Mm -hmm. Little creek right over here. And that way, cold air sinks, thermals are going downhill, and that's much more reliable than a warm day where the thermals are bouncing off and swirling all around. So I hope you all enjoyed this little just demo fire, basically teaching fire. Hopefully it helps you all. And if you're thinking, man, these guys got it made out here working, having fun, getting some free venison every now and then, they don't even have to skin it or gut it. Uh, go to the bottom of growingdeer.com. There's an intern tab there if you want. Now these guys will tell you, don't come if you're playing. Just don't do it because I'll embarrass you. Probably won't embarrass me and I'll send you home. I've done it before. So got to work, right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. What time did you start this morning? 6.30 a.m. 6.30 a.m. What time are you working until tonight? Midnight. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. We're going to wrap up here pretty soon. Really appreciate you guys. You know, fire is just a tool that the Creator gave the planet to rejuvenate or set back vegetation to an early successional form. It's totally natural. So instead of a big controlled lightning fire or Native American set fire that burns to a river or snow puts it out, we're doing a prescribed fire with a prescription. Just like we want a prescription for our burns, you need a prescription for your life. And you find that by studying God's Word and seeking His will for your life daily. Thanks for watching. Join Deer.